<clears throat> the recording is now in progress. Right. So, I guess, Jose, did you have anything? Yeah, thank you all say? for being here. Um, welcome to the last presentation of the semester, but I, I promise it's going to be a very good one. So, thank you all for joining us, and thank you to our colleagues at the Oral History Center for, for joining us today um, to give us this wonderful presentation. I believe Christine will introduce them all and uh, we'll get started soon. So thank you all for being here. Okay, so let's get started then. The Oral History Center is a research unit of the Bancroft Library. It was founded in 1953 and has conducted more than 4,000 oral histories totaling tens of thousands of interview hours. Nearly every interview has been transcribed and is available for the public to read on the Oral History Center website, which we'll share in the chat for you. Roger Early Pryor joined the Oral History Center in 2018. He's a historian of modern US history with specializations in science and nature. Shanna Farrell has been an interviewer with the Oral History Center since 2013, and she specializes in the environment, arts and culture, food, and the beverage industry. Amanda Tweez has been an interviewer with the OHC since 2018, and she specializes in politics, as well as arts and culture. Early Pryor, Farrell, and Tweez serve as the leads for the Japanese American Intergenerational Narratives Oral History Project. In preparation for this work, they underwent training for trauma-informed interview practices and cultural competency. So now without further ado, let's get started. Amanda, I believe you are starting us off. I'll hand the microphone over to you. Thank you, Christine and Jose. We're really, really happy to be here and to be able to share some of our work with all of you. Um, so today we're gonna give you a background of the Japanese American Intergenerational Narratives Oral History Project how we came to it, uh, the design of the project, so our approach to this oral history work. We will also share with you some of the major themes that came out of the interviews we've done, nearly 100 hours of interviews. And most importantly, we're gonna share with you audio clip examples from uh, these interviews so that the narrators can speak for themselves. Uh, Jose, would you please advance the slide for us here? Next slide, please. I'm trying, I promise. Oh no. <laughs> there we go. Is awesome, it? thank you. Okay, uh, so what is this project? Uh, the Japanese American Intergenerational Narratives Oral History Project documents the intergenerational impact of the United States government's incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. So we are using life history approach to oral history to think through this intergenerational impact. Um, next slide, please. We go back one up, other direction. Apologies, this is it's taking uh, a little longer than yeah, it's tender. Google Drive has been sensitive. Is it one more slide down if we could? Yep. Doing my best. Good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Why did we go about doing this project? Um, I think for all three of the interviewers on this project that our personal reasons uh, really drove our interest and our passion for this project, but there are also some really strong institutional reasons why the Oral History Center um, and at the Bancroft Library would engage in a project like this. One of them is to build on the existing archive that the Bancroft Library already has, and that includes both the oral history archive as well as the traditional uh, material object archive and paper archive that the Bancroft has. Oral history interviews um, exist in the, in the Oral History Center archive collection with Japanese Americans in what we call our Japanese American confinement oral histories. There's an image on the screen where you can see some examples of those. And those um, often include former UC Berkeley students, many of whom were forced into the prison camps during World War II. 
Also, the Bancroft, I think, is well known to many people that are attending the talk today, um, has an extensive and outstanding collection on the archival collections related to the Japanese American incarcerations during World War II. Um, many of you were able to experience the uprooted exhibit that featured some of those um, uh, material objects and images, as well as some of the oral histories that were a part of that, a nice collaboration at the Bancroft. Another reason for why this project was done um, at the Oral History Center is our capacity for a large and complex oral history project like this. We have three full-time interviewers on this project that were able to dedicate two to three years of our working um, lives to, to really making this project become a reality. And also um, extensive editorial and technical staff, both with managers and student employees, um, who all can help make this project uh, become a reality and become publicly available for everyone to experience. Um, another aspect was the timing of this. We began a lot of our planning and discussion to engage in this project just as the COVID-19 pandemic began. Um, as we transitioned to trying to figure out how we would all cope with that and continue the operations of the center, we um, used Zoom and had a lot of downtime to collaborate and think through how we could move about a big project like this that would be a, a multi-year project. And then Shannon will speak a bit more to this, but we also knew that there was um, an identified source of funding. And at the Oral History Center, we absolutely have to have outside funding in order for us to do any kind of project. And when this big and ambitious, we um, knew that there was a, a possibility to apply for that funding. Um, but really importantly was also our desire to develop um, and build our cultural competency at the Oral History Center. We are three white interviewers um, going to be interviewing people who often identify as people of color and um, talking about a traumatic experience that impacted their family. And I think all three of us really wanted to develop those kind of skill sets as oral historians and also realize the importance of the stories that would be told in that. And on a personal note for myself, I grew up in Ohio and this history of the incarcerations of Japanese Americans across the West Coast into the interior of the country during World War II was not something that I was taught during my education. Um, in fact, the first time I learned about it, I was at, at University of California, Santa Barbara as a TA in a US history class. And one of my students told me they wanted to write a paper about what happened to their families and the incarcerations. And it shocked me that that was the first time I learned about it essentially as the teacher of a college level class. Uh, and this was new information to me that had not been a part of my traditional education. And uh, uh, we all have our own reasons as well. Shanna? Yeah, similarly to Roger, I also did not grow up in California. I'm from New York State, and we didn't learn about this in school either. The first time that I heard about this was actually when I started working at the Oral History Center. I was doing some interviews that were not related to this topic, but it came up. Uh, the, the, the husband of somebody had been incarcerated during World War II. And um, I, my mind was blown. I was like, why don't I know about this? I think this is really important. It's American history, especially in the context of post-2016 and some of the issues that were coming up then, which we will talk about and were talked about in our interviews. I think this was particularly important so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And I did grow up in California, so this is a history that I was familiar with, but I always heard about it as sort of a historical footnote to either World War II history or like social justice movements uh, as a whole. And as Shanna pointed out to me, oral historians are really interested in these footnotes because there are a lot of really rich stories behind them. Shanna, you are muted. Thanks. Uh, next, we wanted to talk a little bit about funding, which Roger had mentioned. But the Oral History Center is a 501c3. So as a nonprofit, we do have to, we have, we get little, very little university financial support. So we have to have money to do these projects before we can start. I think there's a, a general misconception that we have all this money and we can choose what we want to. And while we would love to do that, that is unfortunately not the reality. So a lot of the funding dictates these projects. And we knew that the National Park Service was giving this federal grant and, and does ever, has been every year for a while now. And so we thought, hey, this is a great opportunity. We've gotten this grant in the past. We have a record showing that we can get these projects done. 
why not apply for something and, and kind of aim big and think, as Roger mentioned, multi-year with lots of different components, doing a larger interview, a, a project than we had in the past. There's close to 100 hours in this project. Um, and then also thinking about interpretive work that we might be able to incorporate and how do we build in funding for that so we have the opportunity to do an interpretive work, which we don't always get to do. So we did spend a lot of time during COVID thinking about how we might approach this, what the model might look like. If we were to dream big, what would our ideal project look like? So we applied in October 2020 for this grant. We heard back in 2021 and uh, we spent so much time on this because we really wanted to be thorough and thoughtful about our approach, which we'll talk a little bit more in detail about. Um, all right, so we part as part of this model, and, and which was also mentioned, we really wanted to be careful about how we were building cultural competency. As three interviewers who identify as white, we were pretty aware that um, we needed a little bit of outside help uh, from people who were not part of the Oral History Center and were connected to the Japanese American community in one aspect or another. So one thing we do sometimes when we are designing oral history projects is we form a group of advisors who have insider knowledge of a community as well as expertise on the topic around which we're interviewing. And again, for this project, we knew that this was a must. Um, and this really helps us build trust with potential narrators in this community and, and others. Um, and we also had asked our advisors to share resources, both historical and research materials that we might not be familiar with, or like, you know, we can do general searches, but there, if they have some insider knowledge about, you know, read this dissertation or listen to this podcast, or, hey, this interview is kind of buried in this archive, you should, you should get familiar with it. And they also helped us connect to networks of people who could be potential narrators for this project. Um, we also spent a lot, a lot of time talking with them to learn about potential issues that might come up during the project planning and the interview phases. Um, so that was really where we leaned on the advisory team. Um, and then we also visited the uh, Japanese American Museum of San Jose, and that was really great because we got to be in their space physically. We also hadn't seen each other because we were working during COVID, so it was nice to see the, the, the team. Um, we, as a, as a team, listened to podcasts, we read different books, and we talked about them, discussed articles, as I mentioned, dis dissertations, and we also learned more about trauma-informed interviewing. We have constantly need to do learning on this, but this is a subset of oral history, and it requires a different set of project design, and so uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but this was something that we uh, wanted to pay particularly close attention to. We also were planning on visiting the sites we focused, um, which we'll talk about in a second, the, the two sites that we were focusing on, we really wanted to go visit, but unfortunately because of COVID we couldn't. So that was one thing we had intended to do, but couldn't. And on that note, uh, we'll talk about the sites that we selected. Yeah, as Shanna mentioned, we focused this project around two sites of incarceration, Manzanar in California and Topaz in Utah. And uh, the reason we chose these two sites was to anchor the stories we wanted to document in site-specific work. A um, few reasons for that. One, this is the MPS Jacks grant model um, where they're asking us to think about site-specific historical work. Another is, we were interested in having a comparative lens uh, between sites of incarceration and this uh, intergenerational impact. Um, and again, thinking about our public versus private theme, public memory versus private healing. And this takes place in Manzanar because it is a um, national historic site. All of us have ownership in this site and its interpretation. Topaz is a private museum and a private site, and so the stakeholders are a little bit different, and so there was a comparative lens there. Also thinking about the geographic connection to both of these sites. Um, Japanese Americans in California were forcibly removed to these sites in great numbers. Manzanar mainly folks from the greater Los Angeles area and Topaz in the Bay Area. And next slide, please. 
talk a little bit about the project design here. It was a, a complex project and again, took a long time to plan it out and has been even longer in actually ex um, executing it. But one of the main things that we were, um, we we're really interested in trying to learn from and build upon was the experience of Holocaust survivors and their descendants understanding and processing intergenerational trauma um, from the Holocaust as that was uh, those events had been passed down to those who uh, from the survivors to the descendants and applying that sort of model to what it has the ex experience of Japanese Americans from the post-war era to the present. Um, there's also a practical aspect of this is that most other oral history projects with Japanese Americans that involve incarceration are focused on the survivors of the camps, those who experienced the incarcerations during those years of World War II. And as the survivor generation has passed away and continues to pass away, it's really important for us to hear from the descendants of those survivors, the Japanese Americans today, whose families have been incarcerated, and how this history has shaped their own experiences of being Americans um, and their own sense of identity and belonging, and also the meaning making that they have for these particular sites. As the generation who was confined at those sites um, moves on, what is the meaning of those sites for those who remain? And that's not just for descendants, but also for all of us as Americans. Um, what do we learn from these and what meaning can, can, can we take from that? And to hear from the descendants, especially about that from their point of view. One other Thing that we were designing the project around was this theme of healing and asking the question, is healing possible? Has it happened? These were central questions as we were writing this grant, as we were thinking about how we might approach the interviews. And as Amanda mentioned, we were thinking about, oh, and I should also mention that is healing possible was actually the title of our grant proposal. <laughs> so that was baked into the very core of our uh, uh, grant um, but as Amanda mentioned, we were thinking about this through the lens of public and private memory. So healing is often a pretty personal and private process. And sometimes we wanted to look at how people are thinking about that as a private process, but also what happens then in a public way. So let me just kind of break this down a little bit. So we, for this, this project, we did interview a, a number of artists who were either writers or painters or photographers or musicians. And when you make art, that is often a private personal process. But when you're done, you put it out into the world and you make it public. So what happens when the private becomes public? Is there healing that can happen from that process? And conversely, when you go to a public site like Manzanar, and you're taking all of this in, in a, in a public place, you're internalizing it because it's your experience of visiting the site. And so what happens when the public becomes private? Can that help with healing? Does that make it possible? So we didn't really have a set answer to all these things. That wasn't our intention. We just wanted to talk to people about how they related to those questions and what that meant for them. And hearkening back to what I recently mentioned about Manzanar and Topaz being the basis of our project, um, we were really interested in meaning making about place. So connecting the power of place to storytelling, which is what we're doing in oral history. We wanted to do this with the uh, particular sites as important narratives in the element. And this showed up uh, in thinking about environmental impacts of these prison camps, but most importantly, their impact on identity and belonging, the role of home and placelessness, um, and memories connected to place and landscapes. And I just want to reiterate the importance of these places in our narrators' lives, even if they've never been and even if they do not wish to visit Manzanar or Topaz, these uh, Manzanar and Topaz uh, ring really true in their lives. The next challenge for this project was trying to figure out who we could interview for this in the limited number of interviews that we could do given the funding that we had received from the federal government to do the project. Um, we knew that we wanted to have descendants from both of these sites as a part of the project design. Um, and we knew that we would um, look to our advisory committee for, for, for starting with this process. The, the folks who 
were helping us understand um, how this project would evolve and talking through all that with them. And the people who are plugged into the Japanese American community in a different way than any of us um, really ever could be. And so though that was a, a place for beginning discussions and thinking through things and getting ideas, but the real avenue through which we were able to, to find narrators and, and um, go through this process was through a Google form that we sent out uh, and asked people to share and fill out either for nominating themselves or other people that they thought might be good narrators or interested in participating in this project. And that gave us um, a, this, a huge list that we could then try to talk through again together and say, how do we balance this in terms of location? How do we balance this in terms of generations? How do we balance this in terms of gender? Um, so we could have a real diversity of experiences recorded in this one project with the, the number of interviews that we could do. Another aspect to think about in terms of narrator selection is, are you willing to participate in a project like this? And that is not an easy ask. It's, a, it's actually a pretty big ask, not just in terms of the time and the commitment to do these interviews, to go through our very extensive process of editing collectively, and then um, before anyone else is able to really experience what was said. Um, this whole process is also involves potential revisiting of traumas, uh, intergenerational traumas, the focus of this project. And so asking people, are you willing to tell these stories and share that with us and have it recorded and then shared in a public archive? Um, and so that wasn't always an easy thing to ask, but for the most part, the people that we um, were able to, to include in the project were wonderful partners in getting that done and, and being so honest and sharing their stories. We wanted to talk a little bit about the oral history methodology. So basically how we did the actual interviews. So in oral history, we take something called the life history approach, which means that we start at the beginning of someone's life and we work forward to the present. And in, in, the, in that whole arc of the interview, we're hitting on um, different themes and topics, which are mutually agreed upon during the conversations we have leading up to the interviews with the narrators themselves. We did the interviews over Zoom because of the pandemic. We weren't able to travel. So that was one of the, the criteria was that we, we could speak over Zoom. Most of the interviews are about four hours each across two two-hour sessions. So we went back and talked to people multiple times. And for the process, what we do is we talk to a narrator first. Transparency is really at the heart of oral history. So we do something called a pre-interview in which we talk to the narrator, let them know what we're doing, why we're doing it, that it's going to be recorded, what's going to happen with it, meaning it's going to be in an archive. And in this case, we are going to be doing some interpretive work. Um, and how what things we might talk about in the interview. There's there's a lot of other things that we we talk about in there, but that's <laughs> probably don't have time to go into an exhaustive list there. But we do talk to them in advance, and then we put together an outline, and that is a collaborative process. It's co-created, so I'm letting a narrator know what what my agenda is, and they can give us feedback and say, you know what, this is an important, or this is wrong, or you know, I'd love to talk about this. Let's add this. So it's a, um, we want to make sure that their agenda and the things that they want to talk about are being honored as well. Um, once we do the interviews, which are recorded, they are transcribed. The audio goes out to a transcriber. We review them just for spelling and grammar. The narrator reviews them and they can make substantial edits. Um, well, sorry, not substantial edits. We try not to have substantial edits. They can make edits for content. We don't do that as interviewers. Um, and then the transcripts, once we input their edits, they go online and uh, they're something called OMS, which is a very uh, oral history word. It's the oral history metadata synchronized system where you basically can watch the interview and listen to it while the transcript is playing underneath. Um, and then we also did healing circles. Um, and so what that means is, is one of our project advisors, Lisa Nakamura, is a psychotherapist who specializes in intergenerational trauma and is herself a descendant of one of the camps. She ran healing circles for our narrators, which were optional for them. They didn't have to participate, but they absolutely had the opportunity if they wanted it. And the goal of these were to process their experiences of being interviewed by us. 
Um, we weren't present at these healing circles and nor do we know who attended or what was said. This was purely for them. It was a resource for our narrators. And that was part of the, the trauma informed project design. Um, and then the last part of this is the interpretive work, which we've mentioned a couple of times, but we built in some graphic art to be done. Um, we are working with a graphic artist named Emily Ellen, um, Elin, uh, to illustrate some scenes and some, some that we're still, it's in progress right now. So we're, we're waiting, we're, we're working on the final project, but it's to illustrate some of the narratives and some of the themes that are coming out of the oral histories. And then we're also working on a podcast, uh, based on the oral history interviews with a producer, Rose Core, And we're also in the, the production phase of that right now. So as promised, uh, we are going to share with you some major themes that came out of these oral histories. Some of these were intentional, we had built into our project design, and some of these were a surprise to us that themes kept coming up over and over again. It was um, really um, eye-opening for us to hear about each other's interviews and where these were coming through. Um, so just a, a smattering of some options here. Intergenerational aspects was a meta theme, again, built into the project. Healing, which we are going to discuss a bit today. Silences and remembering. Uh, art and expression. The public versus private memory again. Identity and belonging. Memorialization, especially pilgrimages to the sites of incarceration. Finding and creating community. Civic and community engagement and historical through lines, like common memories of things like the Vietnam War, the redress movement, and uh, the commission on wartime relocation and internment of civilians, 9-11, um, the Trump administration. So uh, the first thing we're gonna share with you is the theme of healing. And I'm going to uh, introduce the narrators first and then give you a little bit background about the clips. So we're gonna hear from Bruce Embry, who is a sansei, which means third generation Japanese American. Uh, he spent his professional life working in political organizing and campaigning. He's also currently the co-chair of the Manzanar Committee. Uh, his mother, Sue Kunitomi Embry, was incarcerated at Manzanar and was a well-known activist, not just in the Japanese American community, but for a variety of causes. And among many other really important things, she co-founded the Manzanar Committee in 1970 and organized the annual pilgrimage for many years. Uh, she led the campaign to have Manzanar dedicated as a California historic site in 1972 and as a national historic site in 1992. Uh, Carolyn Iyoye Irving is also a sansei and an employee of UC Berkeley. So Carolyn, if you're watching, hi. Uh, she grew up on California's central coast, but did live in Japan uh, several times in her life. The United States government incarcerated her family in prison camps at Tanfran and Topaz. And Jean Habino is also a sansei who was born and raised on the East Coast. During World War II, her parents were forcibly removed from Berkeley and imprisoned at Topaz. Uh, the Quakers helped her parents leave Topaz to continue their educations, and they never returned to the West Coast. Jean graduated from UC Berkeley in 1974, and today she and her daughter help run a student scholarship fund that Jean's Nisei parents co-founded in 1980 to commemorate the Quakers' support of Japanese American students during World War II. And uh, these clips are going to center around healing. Again, the questions we were asking narrators around healing as an open question. Is healing possible? What would it mean to heal? And what does healing mean to you? So let's take a listen to that. So the clip is playing. Uh, can you hear it? No. Let me try the volume. That would help. All right, let's start over. Here we go. Nope. Jose, perhaps if you unmuted, that might help. Yeah.
talking about in today's efforts. My mother always talked about the creation of a site and the role of the pilgrimages as a source of healing a trauma. She talked about healing and she talked about writing justice and she talked about social change as healing. You don't heal by simply gazing at your navel. You heal by writing wrongs and by fighting oppression and gaining your voice. A lot of, again, this questioning that I'm talking about in some exploration, I, I do view it in a whole way as sort of a personal healing. I mean, I know there's an obvious suppressed grief over the losses I've had in my own life, my parents, my siblings. But then, you know, even think, well, how much of who I am is actually carried over from what my mom went through or my dad. And so I do think, again, the more one explores, even though it might be a difficult process, that it's always kind of a path to healing. You know, it's kind of like when you have to right. open a wound to clean it out and, and then it heals over eventually. I don't know if I'm, I'm sure healing is a word that I like. I don't know. When I hear healing, it's like personally hurt. I mean, like, I was in a car accident, so now I have to heal from broken or whatever. So I don't know, maybe it's a more mental healing, I guess. I, I am not sure how I would describe it, but more to be as this process of what my mom went through and her way of dealing, and I would not say healing, but dealing with what she did was to turn that thing into a life fulfilled with family and activism and giving back. Thank you for those. Another um, aspect that we'll present today among the many themes that have come up is the theme of silences and remembering. Um, silence about camp, especially for that um, Issei and Nisei generation who often didn't tell stories to their own Sansei children about their experiences in camp. And then in connection with the remembering aspect is the role that redress played in helping break some of those silences. The redress movement itself was an effort to obtain restitution of civil rights, an apology from the federal government, and monetary compensation from the government for the mass removal and confinement of Japanese Americans during World War II. The efforts eventually resulted, after uh, over a decade of activism, it resulted in federal hearings in 1981, which featured spoken and written testimonies from survivors and descendants of the camps, and ultimately in the U.S. Congress's passage of the Civil Liberties Act in 1988, which was signed by President Ronald Reagan. That act provided a national apology and then individual payments of $20,000, which is um, a really nominal fee in a lot of ways for the surviving detainees. Um, as an aside, um, Emmy Kumiyama at Stanford and our OHC Oral History Center colleague Todd Holmes completed an oral history project that centered around the Office of the Redress Administration, the federal government that was the office that was charged with um, enacting the Civil Liberties Act signed by Reagan. And they turned their work into a great documentary that's called Redress. You could find that online at JapaneseAmericanRedress.org. For the clips that we'll show you from our oral history project on um, the Japanese American Intergenerational Narratives Project, we're going to hear from um, three of our 23 total narrators. The first one, uh, first person that you'll hear from is Masako Takahashi, pictured on the left. Um, Masako is a multimedia artist, she's a fashion designer, and a sansei who was born at Topaz while her parents were imprisoned there. Uh, Masako was raised in San Francisco, and after traveling the world, she earned her art degree from UC Berkeley. She'll speak uh, specifically to the theme of silences. Kimi Maru, pictured in the middle, is also a sansei and a former employee of the California State University of Los Angeles. Kimi grew up in Piedmont, California, and her parents grew up in Berkeley. And during World War II, the US government incarcerated her family in prison camps at Gila River in Arizona, at Tanfran, and then at Topaz in Utah. She will speak on uh, the topic of redress, as will Reverend Michael Yoshi, He's pictured on the far right. He's a retired United Methodist pastor and social justice activist who is also Sansei. During World War II, his parents and relatives were incarcerated at Topaz in Utah and at Jerome uh, Prison Camp in Arkansas. 
Uh, Michael graduated from UC Berkeley in, UC, in 1974 and also testified at the San Francisco hearings um, on redress in 1981. So if we could play their three clips, please. Just generally speaking, it was a horrible and shocking experience. But they, like many others, did not speak that much about camp. I mentioned it and my father said, well, when, when you're ready, you can learn all about it. He ended up being the editor of the Times. They have every issue of that that I could read. The whole subject was always very hard for me because as a child, I felt ashamed because it seemed bad to be the children of people who the government wanted to lock up and called an enemy. I guess they were just trying to spare us feeling bad. So they just didn't talk about it and looked forward and, you know, what are you going to study today in school and looking forward. And it wasn't until much later in the early 80s when the redress movement started that my parents really, you know, opened up a little bit more about their experience and what they felt about it and stuff. But it wasn't until until the redress movement came about and people, Nisei's, and the UCs at the time really started opening up and speaking about what they went through. Before that, many people, especially Sansei's, never even heard their parents utter a word about it. It was just not something that people spoke about. It was through the redress movement that I think it really brought the community together and really opened up a chapter in history that needed to be talked about. The younger generations needed to learn about what people went through. And it was really something that I think was kind of cathartic for the community to express anger and the pain, all, all the rage, all these different emotions that were held in for so many years. And it was just so profound, the, the uh, energy there of people, you know, like there were like 500 people in the room and just the gripping testimonies from, from each stage, from each stage, and Santos like myself. And just, feel people just listen to every word. It was a very cathartic experience to me, for me personally, but it was clearly a cathartic experience for our whole community. But I do think there was this, this positive dynamic in having Sanchez testify, as it meant that there was an intergenerational presence in the world, that the commissioners were doing, and that also our community was feeling, you know, this intergenerational solidarity around this particular issue. It was a very strong feeling. Um, for me personally, it was like my voice mattered too. My story in this. One of the other themes that we were exploring was identity and belonging. And this showed up in a lot of different ways, but a lot of times this is kind of, it, you know, it can be a heavy topic, but it can be a bit of a lighter one as well. And we wanted to make sure that everything we were talking to people about wasn't just extremely heavy, because that's not representative of a person's whole life. Um, and so, you know, we were talking to them about their travel to Japan, which is something we found that many narrators had relationships with, or um, what it was like growing up outside of Japanese American communities, what it was like to have mixed identity, religion. Um, and one thing that we're going to play uh, our clips about is holidays, rituals, or family traditions, which bring up good memories and are, are happy things and um, memorable times. Um, and so the, the narrators in these two clips that we're going to play are uh, Jennifer Mariko Newwalder, who is a, a sansei, and a psychiatrist who specializes in intergenerational trauma and intersectionality. She grew up in New Jersey, and her family includes not only survivors of Japanese-American incarceration, but also survivors of the Holocaust. During World War II, the United States government incarcerated her family in prison camps at both uh, Tanfran and then Topaz. And then we're going to hear from Peggy Takahashi, who is a native Californian Nisei, who grew up in the greater Los Angeles area, close to where her parents owned and operated a farm and farm stand. I mean, Christmas was the best because we'd have this big party on Christmas Day. So we'd have like all the Jews and the couple Japanese people we knew. And 
you know, I guess agnostics. And Christmas, we'd have a big antipasto. We'd have like a fabulous lasagna. We'd have like the turkey and ham and a big plate of sushi. And we'd have ropes on kugel, which are these like chocolates from Vienna. Meals, meals in my family, we might have like Vienna schnitzel one night, a very Italian green bean salad with olive oil and vinegar. But then the next night we might have chicken teriyaki with you know, rice. You know, usually had a salad, which I think is probably more the European influence. Lots of cheese, mochi, and you know, various members of my family went through periods of only using chopsticks. Mochitsuki was a big one. New Year's was a big one. Mochi is pounded sweet rice. You steam the sweet rice, and then you kind of mush it together, and then you pound it until it kind of did. It has a red light consistency, only very firm. And then you make little balls of it and you freeze it. So mochi was what we did at somewhere around December 28th, 29th. All the uncles would, and the aunts would get together, get up really early. The night before we would you know, wash out the, the stone, put hot water in it, get it ready, and then start early with steaming the rice. And we'd count like 70 or 80 pounds. Oh, all right. Um, and we also were thinking about the theme of memorialization. Memorialization showed up in many different ways that people wanted to memorialize this incarceration past, but privilege pilgrimages were a common way which our narrators talked about expressing their connections to these sites and to the physical history of these sites. Um, again, this link goes back to the meaning making about um, site specific work. Um, the two narrators that we're going to feature here are Hanako Wakotsky Chong, who is Gose or fifth generation, and the superintendent of the Hano Uli Uli National Historic Site in Hawaii. Her public history career has included work at Tuli Lake National Monument and Minidoka National Historic Site. Um, Wakotsky Chong was born in the San Francisco Bay Area, but she grew up in Boise, Idaho. During World War II, the United States government incarcerated her family in prison camps in Manzanar and Minidoka. And Hans Goto, who is a native Californian Sanse who grew up outside of Los Angeles. Both of his parents were physicians in the camps and were incarcerated first at Manzanar and then later at Topaz. Um, so go ahead and play, Shanna. You know, Manzanar is also a unique thing, right? Because it's like originally it's just like a one day event, but they've been expanding a little bit to do some cultural events the day before. And that's really cool too, you know, but it's still super powerful because it's one of the largest pilgrimages where sometimes they'll have like, you know, a thousand people or, you know, are there and you just get all these people together and there's a lot of like youth engagement and a lot of allyship with other BIPAC communities, which is kind of really cool. And then you got um, Topaz, the site is just incredible because it literally like, I, like, I'm not a religious person, but this is the only way I feel like I can actually describe it. It's like a rapture. And every, like, things just disappeared, but, like, you, you can walk on, like, the paths, because you can kind of still see it delineated, but then, like, there's stuff on the ground, like, pottery, or, like, um, pennies, stuff like that, like, as if people just disappear. And it's a very eerie sense, but it's also, like, incredibly, like, I don't know what's the right word, like, like it, it just makes you feel really sick and it, but it's also haunting at the same time but then it's also you're able to connect with the site but it's just like it's just incredible my cousin had me carry the topaz by that was uh a little bit nerve-wracking i you know sort of to be kind of the the focus of attention and not knowing exactly what i was supposed to do except follow the person in front of me um but i felt very honored that my uh, cousin said I should do it. But it was a real honor to stand amongst the other uh, people who were there. I think there were 11 flags. It was like the 42nd flag and so on and so forth. So maybe 12 flags. No one was young. It was just, they were all 
all of a certain age and it was just it, it was uh, quite an honor to to be there to stand in this magnificent place in the middle of the desert where families were Our last uh, set of clips that, or clip that we'll share with you today comes around the theme of civic and community engagement. And this uh, speaks to ways in which our narrators, the experiences of, our, of the family members of our narrators inspired their own public and civic activism in some sort of, sort of way, um, whether that was political campaigns or street protests or careers in public service. The narrator that we'll hear in this clip is Nancy Ukai, who's a Sansei writer and a researcher who was born and raised in Berkeley. Both her parents were imprisoned at Topaz in Utah. After college, Nancy lived in Japan for 14 years and she eventually returned to Berkeley in 2008. She's a member of the Wakasa Memorial Committee and she participated in protests against US immigration policies with a group called Suru for Solidarity. And that's what you hear a little bit about now. I guess it must have been 2018, there was a national day of, of opposition to the zero tolerance policy. And it was keep families together. And, and you know, it was going to be a national day of, of, of solidarity. Some of them were in their 80s and even 90s, possibly. And, you know, we're holding up signs saying families belong together. No more separation. Protect the children. And directly tied their incarceration experience as children and survivors of the camps to what is happening now. And it's like, it can happen again. It is happening again. It's happening now. So this idea of never again, it's like, no, it's happening now. So that is the Japanese American Intergenerational Narratives Oral History Project. Uh, we want to thank you so much for being here today, for listening to us talk about this project, about this work, listening to our narrators. Um, we are working on getting the transcripts finalized and live and accessible, so stay tuned for more of that. But we would love to hear some questions that you might have about the, this work. There was one question that came in through the um, through the chat, which is for all of you. It's from Charles Wallenberg, and he asks, uh, let's see, where did it go? Sorry, <laughs> I have to scroll back up here. He, he's wondering if you interviewed any relatives of the renunciants who renounced U.S. citizenship and then fought to get it back. You know, I don't think we were able to um, interview any of those folks. And again, because these were site specific oral histories, um, those were not stories necessarily connected to Manzanar and Topaz. However, or that we found in our particular um, survey of narrators. However, I did interview someone whose family answered no, no on the loyalty questionnaire and was sent from Manzanar to Tule Lake. So that was um, definitely a really powerful storyline to hear. Yeah. I Virtually all of the people who did renounce were at Tule Lake, but many of them had originally come from Manzanar or from Topaz. Um, and I would, and they face special problems, partly because of the amount of discrimination and prejudice they felt within the Japanese American community. Um, and be interesting to talk to people who grew up in those households. Um, and some of those themes that you're talking about would be, I think, special for those 5,000 or so families. Agreed. Those are certainly powerful stories. Um, again, because of the way our narrator pool worked out, that was not, uh, those were not folks we got, were able to talk to. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, so feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question live or leave it in the chat. And we're happy to stay a few minutes past one o'clock too, in case um, in case we need to uh, allow some extra time. Ah, yes, Lily, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. I don't know if this is a, a question or more like a statement. Just trying to figure out what was the reason that, because I actually had a 
a cohort of mine who gave a report her, about her grandparents <clears throat> being incarcerated. And she did share that, you know, her grandparents didn't talk anything about it. And when the, when the 20 grand was given out, they want nothing to do with it. They give it to the grandkids. And it was only after hearing from her, and that was back in 1997 or eight. And to find out that the hometown I grew up in, Santa Anita, um, Arcadia, had the Santa Anita Fashion Park, or no, Santa Anita Racing Track that housed a lot of the, it was like, I grew up there, never heard anything about it till like more recently. And why, like, it, it does sound really dumb. It's like, why is it like that? And then wh for me, it's like, why was the, <clears throat> why, why did um, the American citizen who was from Japanese descent not want to talk about it and say that was wrong of the government? And yeah, it's like, yes, it's, we don't want to repeat it. And it is happening with the most recent Trump era issue. But why is it that way? I guess it's my question. Lily, silence is a huge part of this project. It came up in every single interview and it really depended, you know, it, it, it pertained to so many different topics. Um, and it's really interesting how different families, inter like how silence showed up and where it showed up. I was actually reviewing a, a transcript this morning and one, um, the narrators, both sides of his family were incarcerated. One side talked about it and one side didn't. And so he grew up hearing stories about one side's family. And then the other side, he had no idea what they experienced. And there, I think that really affected their relationship with the redress movement. Um, and something that did come up quite a bit, and as we heard in the clips, is that that was sort of a moment where families who had been silent talked about it, maybe not with their families, but in a, a public platform, kind of goes to the public private thing again. But it's, I mean, that's a, I think that that's a question what you're asking that a lot of our narrators grapple with too. So I don't, I don't think that we have an answer per se. Um, and I don't know that they have an answer, but it's, it's something we definitely explored in the interviews. Uh, we have a question in the chat from John. He asks, can you talk about how you found your community advisory committee participants? Roger, this might be a good question for you. I was just trying to remember exactly how we did, how that did happen. <laughs> I think when we started our research explorations in intergenerational trauma, particularly for Japanese Americans, we were looking through psychology literature and historical literature. And some of the names that came up of therapists and people doing that research, we reached out to. Um, and uh, through those kinds of discussions, that's how we were able to find Lisa Nakamura as um, a, a psychiatrist or psychologist who's based in the East Bay area and has expertise in this and also a family connection to Topaz. And so that opened up a door of community engagement. Um, and other people that were also uh, UC alumna um, who, who then came into to uh, that also had strong connections to the Japanese American community and helped run pilgrimages for survivors and descendants. Um, and so they also came in on board. Um, that was that was the kind of talking through and starting with the research and then talking through and just sort of expanding communications and saying, you know, would you be willing to, to help us, help guide us in this? And, and having um, a psychologist in particular was really, really useful for us to prepare us and also to help lead the healing circles to give the participants a real um, avenue to process on their own without having our involvement in it. Other questions from this group? I'll jump in and just add, um, there were a couple notes that I forgot to add when I was talking about one of the slides and that was just kind of the statistics of, to give you a sense of the range of participants in the project itself. Um, the generational mix, we've talked about this being an intergenerational project, but out of the 23 narrators that we were able to interview with over uh, about 100 hours of recorded oral history, um, it included 14 women and nine men. The generational mix were about five Nisei, which is second generation Japanese American 
Uh, the majority were Sansei, third generation, about 16 Sansei experiences, one Yonsei and one Gosei. So um, moving through time, but the bulk was people that were born in that post-war era that came up during the um, age of, uh, came of age in the 60s and 70s. Um, and a variety of different camps were described, although we focused specifically on Manzanar and Topaz descendants, the, the number of um, camps that people have descendancy from was fairly wide. They might have, uh, their, their maternal side might have been incarcerated at Manzanar, while their paternal side might have gone, um, been forced into a different kind of camp in a different location. So of the different camps that were discussed broadly across the project include Manzanar, Topaz, but also Tule Lake, Minidoka, Gila River, Rauer and Jerome in Arkansas, and even the Crystal City internment camp in Texas, where um, the Sioux for Solidarity protests were happening because contemporary border separations and family separations were using that Crystal City site. And so some narrators told really powerful stories about um, meeting with people that lived around Crystal City and saying, I remember when the Japanese Americans were here incarcerated during World War II, and they would exchange um, oranges with us through the fence and my family, the Latino family that lived, it was there, that we're exchanging tortillas with them. And so, and then, you know, these conversations were happening in the present moment in, in around 2020, 2018, 2020, and remembering those stories. So th that's also a part of the oral history collection um, in the project. Uh, David, we've got one more question from David Kessler, go ahead. It's not really a, a question, it's kind of a comment. There's a, a writer named Ursula Hege, and she's written books, she's a German American, about how people felt about their experience having that kind of guilt on their shoulders and this in going about their lives. And it's kind of interesting the parallel of the Japanese Americans who are on the other side of that. They were the victims, not the perpetrators. But like it's both a great range of, of how re people reacted to the to the situation in the, in the ensuing generations. I thought that's interesting. I did have a narrator suggest that uh, we think about this as a model, an intergenerational model for many different ethnicities and many different uh, identities, because uh, there are certain events or certain identities that carry that um, intergenerational trauma with them. So yeah, it's really rich topic for exploration and clearly everybody's got a powerful story to share. Okay, hey, well, we just went a little past the one o'clock hour, which I think is fine, but we want to thank our speakers today, Shanna, Amanda, and Roger, for presenting this really important work that, that they were engaged in for so long. And again, they, these will be available online as soon as, as soon as they're able to get them up. And we want to thank you for attending these roundtables throughout the semester. Uh, we'll take a summer hiatus, but we will be back in September. We'll send information about that through email, of course, and um, on campus uh, events calendars. So I guess with that, we'll say goodbye to everyone and thank you again.